When it comes to planting and leading churches, while all churches are in specific contexts, there are certain general principles that apply to everyone. And so today on Practical Church Planting, we're going to share with you seven of our biggest pieces of advice to church planters. Thanks for joining us again today on Practical Church Planting. My name is Brian Nedrosian, and sitting next to me is Dylan Dotson, and today we're going to give you seven of the biggest pieces of advice to church planters. And today's episode is brought to you by The Church Co., the best, fastest, mobile-friendly church website builder. That's right. We use it for our website and for practical planting. Yep. We like it so much. And if you go to pra- if you go to thechurchco.com slash practical, put in practical the promo code, you get 40% off your first two years with Easter coming up. Mm-hmm. It's time to get that website put together. That's right. That's right. It is. So practical, or the, uh, sorry, thechurchco.com. The church co. Slash practical. We use them so much. We've, we've been recon- recommending them way before they became a sponsor. Yes, on that's true. Planting. That's true. And so as a side note, as we talk about some biggest pieces of advice for church planters, as one of the assessors for Acts 29, last week I was at assessment again. Mm-hmm. And so this is the things that people, we give to almost all of all the applicants. So this Almost isn't, everybody. This isn't just our advice. This, this is, is like universal. That's given. Yeah. To, just just like we give to a lot of church planters because these are the things that people need. Mm-hmm. And if you've already planted, it's still good things to talk about and consider and implement if you do not have them. Mm-hmm. So I know it says church planters, but it's really for anybody. Yeah. And I say side note because one of the guys that I assessed in his church planning budget was three thousand dollars for a website. Hmm. Which, if you don't know anything about websites, okay, you yeah. have to pay someone. That's a lot of money. Yeah. The Church Co. Forty percent off their premium plan, twenty nine dollars a month. Yeah. Did you tell them? I didn't because. Well, <laughs> here's the thing. After the guys I assessed, I sent them an email because uh-huh. I don't want to be like a promotion for practical church plan. Yeah, yeah. But it's yeah. like the practical stuff is what everybody's missing out on. Yeah. I mean, it's just like it's so. So I sent them an email with mm-hmm. all these things, and so I told them after the fact. But because I, I don't want people being like. Is he using this assessment to make money? Yeah, yeah. which we don't make <laughs> I money. That. If you go, yeah. just for clarification, if you go use this, we don't get paid. No. for you actually subscribing with them. So. Right. Yeah, anyway, that's true. <laughs> Three thousand dollars was insane, and I guarantee you, it's going to be hard to manage because he doesn't know how to do it, and you have to pay for someone to update it all the time. Yeah, the church code is way better. So that's that's like P, that's like the pre-script to this. That's right. And if you're curious, if you go to ch- the church code, you can look at um uh, like ten or. Like samples of all yeah. the different templates, mm-hmm. and they all look better than like oh geez, all of probably. Them. I mean, I'm sure this guy knows wonderful yep. uh, web designers, whatever, but probably better than any web designer that I have experienced. Yeah, with they're just least. fast, they're they're really easy, great looking, and easy. So that's like before the seven is. It's just like, it's just yep. three thousand dollars. <laughs> I was like, whoa, let me tell you about something that's lovely. Yeah. So again, here that's are the good. things that we tell almost everybody. We go through the process, the interviews, hear all their stuff, hear their preaching, all these different things that. And it's understandable if you're starting out, you haven't thought through all these things mm-hmm. that most people don't have or need to work on to some degree. And so even if you've already launched and you don't have some of these things, my encouragement to you would be to, to think through them. Yep. So here's number one, and it's number one for a reason. Well, I'll say what it is and I'll explain why. It is an elder process, a process for developing the elders and leaders of your church. Um, and in the beginning, it's probably to have some advisory board or a management team because it's, you know, we would recommend not just like picking a couple of people and be like, hey, you should do it. Yeah. <laughs> and what's funny is every time we, we do a and a for a while, you know, for part of the assessment for the planters that can ask us stuff, and people always talk about this and, like, leadership development. And it's always funny because one of the assessors always says, you know, everybody in the room, if you told them one of the biggest mistakes they've made, it was along the lines of this, having somebody too soon or wasn't ready. And then once you install somebody, it is really hard. Yeah. And I always kind of laugh because this has not been – my personal story, but it's not really because anything I did. I just got really fortunate. <laughs> like, because we had a management team that was great, and then our elders now are great. And um, and so, like, but I don't know. It wasn't really... I In the beginning, I didn't necessarily plan it this way. It yeah. just happened really well. And it could have been really... It could have gone really poorly in another situation. Yeah, true. And so what yeah. happens oftentimes is you want leaders, you want elders, you want people to help you, you know, do these things. And even if they sound... They're theologically really sound, and you get... To, and you get... And you click really well... There's just so much you don't know, and what happens is when you officially put someone in a position, it gets really hard to remove them if there's issues down the line, and you need a process to even know whether this person is good. So just because they are successful in business and love Jesus, or their theology might be right, it doesn't mean it's a practical fit. Like I asked one of the guys who was planting from another church and has an elder coming with him, or two elders coming with him, because hmm. they're planting nearby. I was like, tell me about this. Um whose decision was it? Do you like them? And he like thought it was really funny. And I was like, no, I'm serious. Yeah. Like, 
do you like them? <laughs> because if you don't, it's going to be a big problem. And so a process is, it cannot just be, we like them, this sounds good, yeah. let's do it. And so a lot of people, again, in the beginning, you're trying to figure out what to do, you're not sure what to do, you just take some people, it's like, oh, you sound good, this sounds good. Developing a process that you know takes them... I don't know, six months to a year to figure out this is good. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, have a, you know, we had a management team, whatever you want to call it, and kind of an outside board that can give you counsel and leadership advice um, and be and clear, like, this is not, like, this is not the elder board. Yeah. And maybe you have someone from your church on the beginning advisory team. You need to be really clear about expectations and, like, this is, does not mean you're going to be when we actually install them on our own. Mm -hmm. And so having a process in place of how you're going to get them is often not had because you're starting out which will cause you a lot of, it will save you a lot of pain in the future if you have something like this. Yeah. We, um, so we have an elder process that we send people through. Yep. Do you want, it's, it's a little bit of a longer process. Do you want to take like a, give like a quick 10 second snapshot of like a brief idea? So when we, yeah. Like? So when we try to put ours in place, last year's when we, two years, a year and a half, so, uh, 20, I don't know. 20, I think. Yeah. So about right, a year and a half ago. Yeah, yeah. For that. We were like, I was looking up online and talking to people. And so a lot of the big churches that have their process online, it was like two years. Mm. And just for us, that's just not necessary. We're not, yeah. depending on your size, your church, whatever. So like, how do you have something? So we kind of put it together. I don't know. Got, took some pieces here, just thing that will take you like six to nine months to go through. And it's a series of like interviews, books you have to read. You have to come to some of the elder team meetings. There's a, it starts with like a theological questionnaire that you have to answer to make sure you're on the same page and mm -hmm. like without us telling you what you should answer. Yeah. Like you, and that's what I would say too. If you have some sort of process, don't give people the answer. You need to know what they think. And uh, and so you're happy. If you want something, reach out to us. I can send it to you. Uh, you can tweak it if you want. But it would take you about six-ish months if you wanted to do it quickly, mm -hmm. nine to 12 months if you wanted to take your time, um, which would provide a lot of conversations to know what, what's happening here and not just a, hey, you sound good. Let's just start doing this. Yeah, I mean, this. so this is our first uh, kind of iteration of creating it and sending people through it. And I, I don't always like to be like, we did things so well, whatever, because we're <laughs> learning. And you know, this yeah. is our first time doing it, and obviously... There's always things that come with it, but for a first time doing it, like as we kind of reflect back, and you know, obviously we don't currently have anyone going through it now, but if we were to, as and like I, personally, I went through it thinking back. I don't. There's not much I would think needs to be changed to it. Yeah. Doesn't mean it's perfect. Others are probably doing it better than we are, but for a first time go through, I think it's really good, especially for a young church. So yeah. if you're, I. Everything we do is free to everybody. Like yeah. we, we we hold no secrets. So if you're sitting here wondering, like, hey, I want to create something like this, just shoot us an email and we'll just give it to you. Right. And obviously, you got to tweak it to your own, yeah, uh, whatever, your own liking and what whatever works for you. But there's no reason, especially if you're like a one man team or trying to figure out what this looks like from scratch, to sit there and just sketch out if you're just completely in the dark. And so contact us and at least use it as a jumping off point. Yeah, for us, like and it might change for us in the future. For bigger, that might be different. Sure. Yeah. But like right now, there's a couple of people that are like, oh, maybe one day. And like I feel like this process would be really helpful and would reveal a lot throughout it. And obviously, you have to be very clear when you start. This is not a guarantee. This is, hey, this might not work out, yep. but this is going to help us see. And so the question really is, if you have somebody, how would you raise them up? How would you identify an elder and how would you install them? And it can't just be, well, I think I like them. Yeah. There's got to be a process of people go through and talk through and, and stuff like that. So having some sort of process to create your own local elders is really important. You can, if you want ours, I can send it to you. You can reach out. Yeah, and it's helpful, especially if you start with, like we did with like a management team that are transitioning. Yeah. It's helpful to have a process of what that transition looks like. Even if you're confident that these people are going to become elders, right. whatever. Like we have a few guys on the team that... It was probably pretty understood that that, yeah. that was what was going to happen, but still, it was everyone going through it. And I think of uh, there's another church that we know who has a management team, and they're kind of talking about transitioning to elders. And one of the guys on the management team is unsure if he wants to transition to an elder, which is cool. And because they have this process set up, which is which is good that it helped identify that. Because if we were to just, or if they were to just said like management team, now you're elders, just because <laughs> yeah, you're kind of functioning the same. We'll pray a little bit more, but kind of the same idea. Um, then. It, May have been, may have at kind of like defaulted to having an elder that maybe wasn't one hundred percent into that role, or not one hundred percent comfortable with what comes with that role, but it just kind of defaulted to that. Yep. So having a process of transitioning from like this is more of a kind of more of a the business side management team, kind of a <clears throat> help oversight a little bit to transitioning to actually an eldership role is helpful to actually make that transition. So you yep. don't have anyone that doesn't really want to be in that role or shouldn't be in that role accidentally jumping into it. Yeah, because you know expectations might increase and that sort of thing. So. Yep. 
have something in place that you're going to take people. Do not start. I would recommend with an elder, unless maybe you've known them for a long, long time and you guys are planting the church together. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. Um, have an outside advisory team and then transition when you when you're ready and have a process for that. Yep. Um, number two is work boundaries, and what I mean by that is like predetermined boundaries of nights you're gonna you're willing to do ministry stuff. Mm-hmm. The 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 about the you know clear expectations with your spouse on when you're going to be home most work days, um, you know when you're going to start. Basically, you should know going in because a lot of stuff is up in the air and flexible and changes, and you feel like you have to do everything all the time. You should know going in of here are ex- my working expectations, and I would also say it needs to be solidified and agreed upon with your wife or your spouse if you're you know whether you're the lead pastor or just working there mm. in ministry. You need to communicate with your spouse what these expectations are, because if you do not have them, you will say yes to everything. Your marriage, your family will take the back burner, and it will not go well. And it's really hard to say no unless you have already said, you have already determined in your mind, here is what we're going to do. And I always tell people to start by thinking, what do you want to do? Not what do you have to do, not what do you think is the right, like what do you want to do? If you're planning a church, is you obviously want to do. It's not you're not lazy. Like you're going to want to make this work out. Yeah. But you need to have communicated time that you and your spouse agree upon, so that there's not this frustration and people feeling left out and feeling like ministry is number one. I caveat by saying that there are certainly weeks where that is the expectation or where that is the exception. Sure. Like yeah. that happens. Like yeah. the, for Christine and I, this week is an ex and is is is, a, is an exception to the rule, but it's an exception, so it's not a big deal. Like mm-hmm. we know this is a not normal. It's not always going to be like this, and so you have to say again, how many ministry nights do you want out in a week? And I would say, from the beginning, you need to put this in. Again, there might be some exceptions in the very beginning, but what you start out with in the beginning is the habit and the culture that you're creating, and it's really hard to change later on. Mm-hmm. And so for us, for example, like Christy and I, one of our boundaries is two ministry things a week, a night, two nights a week. Mm-hmm. When our groups are meeting, that's one of them. And then that leaves us for, you know, one other thing that we'll do. Not every week we do two. So sometimes it's just one. Sometimes it's three, but it's the exception and we know it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's predetermined so that we can ensure we're doing the right things in the right ways. And you have to be okay with not fixing all the problems all the time. Mm. You just have to be really clear what they are. Sometimes people ask, like, do I need to tell my church what they are? Generally speaking, I don't I don't I don't think you do. I think you just have your boundaries and say, hey, I can't meet. Here's when I can meet. If there's a problem, you can communicate it. Or if you want to share it with your elders, I you know, I would do that. Or if they have to approve of it, prove it, approve it, that's fine too. But make sure that it's your spouse is okay with it, not like your board's like, no, actually, we want you to work five nights a week. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so I'll just say really practically how this works for us, and then, you know, Brian can jump in. So for us, one of the boundaries is, you know, two, minute, two, two nights a week. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what happened recently was we have four couples in our church that want us to do their pre-marriage counseling, and you can't move weddings back. <laughs> so what do we do? And, you know, Christina likes to, as much as she can, do those. And for us, it, we meet with people, we meet with a couple six times. And so two of them, it was already pre-planned out. We're going to do all six. Mm-hmm. We're going to, Christina's going to be there because we agreed. And the other two were kind of like, they're getting married and they want us to do it. And so we said, well, here's, we didn't, we didn't communicate. Well, we only meet with two people a week and there's some exceptions. We yeah. said, okay, we've got a lot going on. Not busy, but there's a lot going on. There's four couples we're trying to do this with. For one of the couples, I said, I can only meet with you four times um, <clears throat> because their wedding is coming up soon and I'm not going to, I just can't meet with them six weeks in a row at night. Yeah. And for all four of them, we've kind of said, "Hey, if there's any afternoons or during the work day." Mm. So for one, of the, for two of the couples, they are, I don't know, I don't necessarily say they're taking time off work, but like they are coming during their work day, sure, because they yeah. want to get it in. And if we didn't have that boundary, we would have been like, "Sure, let's just for the next three months have way too much going on at night," which would not have been good. Yeah. So because we have that boundary. You have something that we might have to make an exception here or there because that's life and ministry, and there's four of them, and it's for Christina. It's really important, so we're okay with that. But it was a lot. It was really easy for us to say, "Here's when we can meet." Mm. You know, here's we we can only meet with you this many times. It's going to have to be during the afternoons. But having that boundary made that a lot easier. And if we didn't, then we'd just be like, "Sure, we'll do whatever you guys want." Yeah, yeah. I think it's 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 helpful in the sense of. Um, to not over kind of like overcommit, like you're saying, yeah. or, or kind of overstretch yourself and overstretch your marriage. But also, I think it's good to have boundaries where you're not <laughs> just simply not working, like not yeah. necessarily things that you're not saying yes to and like being out of the house or inviting people over, but also like when you're at home, are you at home or are yeah. you at home working? And I think this is tough because church planters, and kind of in a general sense, not all, but uh, 
church planting kind of attracts a more entrepreneurial mm-hmm. type person. And I think it can be really easy to accidentally get in that mindset of you got to you gotta work 24-7 to get this thing off the ground, which is a lie, which yeah. is wrong. But as, especially if, you know, if maybe you've had a little bit of kind of business world experience doing something like that, you can kind of have that idea. And so it can be real easy to, even when I'm not necessarily at the church or at your wherever you coffee shop, wherever you work during the day at home to also be always working on it to be, it doesn't feel like work. Cause I'm like, I'm posting on social media or I'm like, yeah. uh, we're, I'm designing the website <laughs> on my laptop while we're watching a movie together right. or something like that, where it's like, it seems innocuous and it seems like it's not a big deal, but these things can, if you're not careful, can creep into like every there, there's there's a never-ending list of things you could be doing yep. you could always you could always work and always find more things to do and so this can accidentally without noticing just kind of creep into your marriage and creep into your family and before you know it you're not spending any actual time you may be physically present but you're not mentally present with your family at all and so also having those boundaries of like maybe there are some evenings you need to work but yep. they're agreed upon ahead of time mm-hmm. and it's not every evening even in busy seasons like even in busy seasons you can find time for to take time off of yep. working. Um, but I, th- I think that's something that's so easy to accidentally fall into. And I think most people that fall into it, fall into it without even realizing that's what yep. they're doing. So talk to your spouse, yep. agree upon it. Seasons of life are different. I was talking to one guy last week where he has, I think it's Monday or whatever, but he'll w- work like a 12 hour day mm. on purpose. Like, but that's what they agreed upon. And yep. it works for them. And then the rest of the nights he's home on a normal air an hour, but it like helps him get ahead and he feel, makes him feel a lot better. So whatever, whatever you want it to be for you, you should think about it. You should talk, you communicate it, and then you should stick to it. And just for that example I gave her for the pre-marriage, for example, nobody was upset about that. Yeah. But we told them, here's what we can do. You know, here's when we're available. If we're going to get these all in, here's what this is going to look like. Um, they're like, okay, great. And so the vast majority of your people are fine if you yeah. just if you're just clear and honestly they'll respect it. And one of the things too we talked about the assessment is it's just a great leadership for your people to show them that your priorities are in the right place mm-hmm. to help encourage them to also try to set their own in some of their own lives. So work boundaries, when you're going to be home, nights out a week, you know, date nights, put them on the calendar first. If you got stuff with your kids, put those on the calendar first and let everything else fall in from there. And it, like <clears throat> everyone knows this, but I think w- we don't always live it out. Like the church is not the most important thing yeah. in your life. We all know that, but like it can, it can be very easy to accidentally make it be and to think like, I got to be doing things all the time or I got to be meeting people all the time or raising money or whatever. And like, honestly, if, if this, this might sound bad, but if, if you feel like it has, it's taking over your entire life, you should quit. Like <laughs> you, you're, you're, cause if it is taking over your entire life, you'll probably lose your family. Like, yeah. like it, it shouldn't. And, and like, you can make arguments, and I think you you can even get into um, situations where maybe you even maybe your spouse is even agreeing with you working constantly because it seems like it's just for a period of right. time. And there's not an end date, but but happens. there's not an end date, and it's yeah. not healthy. Even if it seems like at least in the beginning we might be on the same page, there may be just some unresolved not wanting to actually communicate what's actually wanted. So you should not be working every, all the time. You yeah. should not be working every single day all the time. Every in the evenings, you should have time separate for your family, or else. This will not go well. Like it, it will be a disaster for you. Yeah, if you're in a season where there's a lot going on, there needs to be a clear end date that you have mm-hmm. put on the calendar that this is done and we're back to our boundaries. Yeah, because a lot of times you won't you won't realize it's a problem until it's too late. And so talk to your spouse, agree upon them, and it will help you say no to things without feeling guilty because you're in this for the long haul, not just for the next six months. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so work boundaries is good. Number three, I don't really know how else to say it. So <laughs> let's say it this way: sexual guardrails. Um, with porn, lust. And for this, I don't necessarily mean, although, sure, it could also mean like, you know, guardrails like meeting with other sp- people of the opposite sex. But I'm not necessarily talking about that. I'm talking more so of porn, lust, you know, sexual past, history. Mm. It's just, I mean, it, it should be assumed that, like for us going into assessment, we assume it's a problem <laughs> and we don't wait for them to tell us sure, so we yeah. can talk about it. and Or it's been a problem or something like that. And so, again, one of the things that, when I would say this, this also has to be agreed upon with your spouse. I'm not, I mean, it, it, porn, for example, is a man and a woman's thing. Like, I'm not, so, obviously, they go both ways. For men, just generally speaking, it's, it can be more of an issue, although it's sure. for both. Yeah. So, for us, when we're talking to the pastors, and one of the things we'll talk about is, like, their history and how it's affected them. When was the last time they looked at porn? Mm-hmm. Has it been a while? And then we also talk about what are your you know, boundaries that you put in place and is your wife, and we'll ask the spouse, are, is she comfortable with them? Because it's one thing to say, hey, I've looked at porn, I've had this problem, here's my sexual past and I'm not going to do that stuff anymore. But then you can see the spouse is like not fully 
comfortable with what was was decided. Mm-hmm. I was like, she should have final say, and you know, what does she want it to look like? Because you you also you might have accountability structures in place, you know, covenant eyes something on your devices, or maybe someone you meet with or whatever, and you might think it's fine. But have you ever asked your spouse like, are they fully comfortable with it? <laughs> yeah. And so there needs to be. It, there should be, regardless if you have a good history or a bad history, if you've been doing well, if you haven't been doing well, you should have proactive guardrails in place. But then your spouse should have a say and to make sure they feel totally comfortable with what they are. So they're not always worried and thinking about it as well. And so sexual guardrails when it comes to porn, lust, all that sort of thing, communicate with your spouse and make sure your spouse says, these are the things that I'm comfortable with doing so that you guys can be on the same page. Yeah, I think a lot of these come down to are you communicating it and is your yep. spouse agreeing to it and and honestly agreeing to it? And are you right. being honest and communicating to them? Like if you're, for, for example, in your example, if you're going to assessment and this is the first time this question has ever come up, that's probably a problem. You know, yeah. if, if you haven't discussed it with your spouse ahead of time and they don't kind of know what you have in place, even I think even if you have really good guardrails in place, yeah. even if you're d- doing all the things and actually doing real well, if they have no idea what those guardrails are or don't... Or it's not a conversation you guys ever have, ever have. Then I think that might be an issue. And it, and if if it's not something you ever talk about, then it's going to be really easy to potentially down the road yeah. get rid of some of those guardrails and fall back into mm-hmm. it if you've never had that discussion before, or if it's not something that you guys really ever talk about. And so have those guardrails there. Make sure they're w- they're well communicated with your spouse that they agree to them. And I think that that's at least a good start. Like yeah. I, I obviously we all know you can. I, a lot of it comes down to the heart, and you can have guardrails, and they won't solve everything. But they need to be, especially in this situation and church planting and stuff, they need to be there, and they're, they're a good start of how you can work towards making sure this isn't a problem in your marriage. Yeah, I think like the work boundaries and the porn, and all that sort of thing. Like we know in our minds that we should be healthy here, mm-hmm. but unless we communicate them and solidify them, it's super easy to just meh. This you know, life has made it different in this season, and this just becomes normal life because you don't know what normal is supposed to be. Mm, yep. And so, talking about them with your spouse, make sure your spouse is okay. And I think sometimes too, like the spouse never thought, and not that either one of them did it this way, but they never thought of like so like doing it that way. It's like, well, here's sure. I had a problem in the past, so let me tell you how I'm going to fix it. And it's like that's just what we're going to do. Mm-hmm. And they never thought, oh, why don't we come to this agreement together? Yeah. Because um, one of the things that's hard too is again, <laughs> when it comes to like planting uh, assessing church planters. Is that the spouses are always very supportive, mm. and so they're going to be they're going to be fine to do with whatever their husband or whatever says because they want this to succeed. They want to see them do well, even if they're not comfortable with it. And it's going to you know a year or two later, it's going to come out that this was a problem because it wasn't discussed ahead of time. Yeah. So, sexual guardrails, you know, agreed upon with your spouse is also really important. Yep. Number four, very few people have this mm. because it's hard to have. Yep. And that it's. You don't know where, where to start for it. <laughs> That's so it true. makes sense. Um, and that is an itemized budget for your church. So you get the, like the prospectus of like, here's how much we want to spend generally, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know, $200,000 or $100,000 for the first year, depending on where you are. And here's going to be a chunk of it's going to be salary, a chunk of it's going to be rent, a chunk of it's going to be ministry expenses. But it's like, how does that all break down? Yeah. And uh, how can you track them? You know what's really funny? I'm going to mention this tonight at our elder meeting. <laughs> I have <laughs> I have become known for, at our assessments as the money guy, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah, Brian. I'm like, if you guys knew how, like, it, it, I don't the money stuff. I'm just like, I think it's important. And like Christy and I have a personal budget, and I like that that I can handle the church budget. I'm like, eh. I just like let them look at all this stuff and tell me there's a problem, and I answer a question. <laughs> the reason I think I've become the money guy is it's not just that; it's just the practical stuff. Like, do you have a budget? Is your strategy practical? Whatever, because the answer is no. And so we talk through talk through that. Uh, that's just funny. But part of it is like I always ask this question. And the answer typically is like no. Mm-hmm. And, and not only that, they don't even know how to make one, yep. and it's hard because yeah. you're not sure what you're going to spend, and you're not sure what your income's going to be. But just like a personal budget, you've got to put it together and guess your, as best as possible and tweak as things go. Mm-hmm. Now, we have on a Google Sheet itemized church budget with multiple tabs. We've shared in our Facebook group before and in our weekly newsletter. Mm-hmm. So you can reach out or search the Practical Church, Practical church Planting Facebook group for the, just type in like church budget sample or whatever, and it'll pop up. Yep. That, that'll give you a place to start because it can be really intimidating to put one together. Mm-hmm. And it's really helpful. Um, but you've got to think through, even though it's not going to be perfect, what do you project the giving to be? Um, what are you going to spend on each area so that you can actually not just, like a lot of people do with their personal finances, hope that the end of the month they're 
checking account has more money in it than out of it. <laughs> yeah. That's just not going to work, yep. especially as things more come, become more complex. And so creating an itemized church budget for all the ministries, not just, we're going to spend $50,000 this year in ministries. Like, well, how's it going to break down? Yep. Putting one together. It's a lot of work, and it's intimidating because you don't know how it's going to work, but you've, you've got to do it. And it'll help for the long-term health of the financial health of your church. And it will give you, it'll make life so much simpler for you when you want to actually spend money because you'll know if you can or can't. Like there's, there's always going to be unforeseen things that come up, but in your first year of church planting, like there's so much stuff that you're going to want to buy or maybe even need to buy. Mm -hmm. And if you have a budget that's telling you, yes, you can afford this or yes, we planned for this, then you don't have to bother emailing, you know, your management team and, <laughs> and contacting everybody and wondering, should I spend money on this or, or is this smart or whatever? Because you have a budget for it, and then you can determine within that budget how that money's used. But it is, it it is tough to create a budget from nothing if you've never started before. And so, get this budget template that we have. Like it's obviously free, and it's a good jumping off point. And we planted our first church out, Citizens Church. We, I helped Adam, who's the church planner, make his first year's budget. And we obviously use the same template that we use at New City. But if we didn't have that, it would have been incredibly yep. difficult. Because <laughs> even with that budget, we were still yep. starting. We're like, because I, I, didn't, I didn't help make our first year budget here at New City. That was before I was here. And so even looking at kind of just the blank template for a few minutes, it was well, you like... you were here. You just weren't on the management team. I, I wasn't. Yeah, I yeah. wasn't in that role. Sorry. Yes. Um, but looking at kind of just a blank budget template at first is yeah tough to figure out where to start. And so one thing that helped and what kind of what we use as a jumping off point is what citizens use is our new city first year's budget. So I looked back at our first year's <laughs> budget and use that as a jumping off point. So this is this is where it really where I think if you have a sending church that really helps mm-hmm. because you could contact us and say, hey, what was your first year's numbers? But unless you live right here in Raleigh, it doesn't matter. Like yeah. different contexts are different things, different sizes. So he's very close and obviously we know a lot of the same people. So it was, it was okay to use as a jumping off point. But if you're if even if you have our budget template and you're wondering, hey, what should I expect the first month offering wise? I don't <laughs> even know. That's a good question, and you should hopefully you have a sending church that's if if they're local, you can contact them and say, hey, do you have anyone that was around in the beginning? Hopefully, it wasn't forty years ago, but you know if it's semi recent, and to, that we can at least use it as a bit of a jumping off point. It's not going to be completely accurate, but you know at the end of our first year of citizens, that their first year's budget, it, it's a ton of guessing and a ton of trying to figure out. It was pretty accurate, yeah. and because we said this is what we're going to do, and then we just stuck to it, and that's what that's what you have to do. I think, and it's it's a lot. It's not as difficult as it seems going into it. Yeah, and at the end of the first year, because you've already started that budget, even though there was a lot of assuming or guessing the first year, it makes the second year a lot easier to go from there because you're not starting oh, yeah. from scratch, which a lot of people do. So considering you know what support you have money coming in, it's also helpful for us. I mean, it's different based on you know where you're planting, all that sort of thing, but how many giving units do you hope to have mm-hmm. and how much do you hope them for them to give a month? Yep. And that can start to give you some assumptions or guesses in terms of financial stuff. And of course, the first couple of years, you might have to tweak it every few months, not every, not once a year, because that can be fluctuating a lot. Yeah. But it just tells you, hey, we have money for this. We don't have money for this right now. We're going to need this much financial stuff and these many givers in order to hit that. And it just allows you to, because there's a lot of stuff that you want, but you don't even know when you can ever get it. Mm-hmm. And a budget it really answers a lot of those questions. So yep. itemized budget, so few people have it, and it is so beneficial. Yeah. Number five, applying the gospel before fixing... The problem. Now, I know this from my personal experience, seeing church planters, conversations. You know, we, we typically have like these exercises where they're throwing us a problem and we're and they just have to talk about how they're gonna fix it mm. in front of us. Now the problem the difficult thing is like whoever like speaks first kind of sets the tone <laughs> because people yeah. kind of feel bad disagreeing or whatever. Mm. So I, I get that. But very often it's like, oh, you know, you have a staff member who had an affair or this bad, this sin issue came up, how would you deal with it? And they, and you talk about it. And it's very easy for us to go straight to scripture, straight to conf- confrontation, straight, straight to I'm going to fix the problem. And not first, I'm going to sit, I'm going to listen, I'm going to hear why they're doing what they're doing, mm-hmm. consider their viewpoint, not that you have to agree with it, and then talk about how the gospel impacts that and how they're still, they are still loved and cared for and how, you know, as we follow Jesus how that impacts how we live and the decisions that we make. And so even if this particular sin isn't black and white in the Bible, wh- how we can use the, w- the wisdom of Scripture to imply, to impact the decisions we're making. When typically, especially early on, particularly the younger you are, it's like, well, here's what the Bible says, here's what I'm supposed to do, and I'm going to do it right now. <laughs> when people talk a lot about Matthew 18, for example, like uh, church discipline, 
and or a public sin, for example. So a ne- public sin needs to be met with public, you know, addressing it publicly. Mm-hmm. And Matthew 18, just as a side note, is for unrepentant sin. It's not for somebody sinned and you got to tell everybody. Even if it's public, it's like you got to take some steps for that. And so really just really, I think it really comes down to understanding, listening, and not condemning right away when someone has a problem in your church. And again, I think part of it is the less experience you have, the more theory it is and the less impersonal it is. So it's easy for you to say, well, I'm just going to tell this person this. Yeah. And you should do the right thing. I'm not saying having experience means you don't do the right thing. I think having experience means you do the right thing in a winsome and a wisdom-filled way. And so just, just be mindful, especially in the beginning, that if there's issues, to be patient, to talk through them, to talk about how the gospel impacts what they're doing, how, how God views them, how God views this, and not just, you need to stop doing this, how dare you, and how are we going to fix the problem today? Yeah, I think that's really good. And I think this goes all the way back to, or ties in well with our first point about having elders mm-hmm. and having elders, especially if you're young, that are older than you, that are more experienced than you in you know, in their faith, I guess, you know, been, been believers for a long time and, and are very seasoned because like, obviously we were fortunate with some things, um, but our management team, two of the guys on our management team have been elders at other churches for a long time, yeah. one of which was a pastor. And so some of these things that would come up, or you know, thankfully they haven't come up with us yet, hopefully they never do, but things like big public sin or, or moral failures or things like that, yeah. we have talked, we, that hasn't come up, but we've talked about it as a group before and it's really helpful to actually deal with or sit and talk with people who have experience with it, who yeah. have dealt with it with others before. Because you can, in a in a group, say, this is what I would do all day long. But when you're <laughs> right. faced with this situation, it's really hard. And not just with this, but with anything. Like It's it's hard to actually apply what you think you're going to apply when you're faced with a situation, especially if hopefully it never happens, but if you're faced with a situation and someone that you really care about and, yeah. and, and love, and they're doing something that you disagree with. So I think it really helps to actually have these elders in place and hopefully you'll be able, you'll be able to get someone who's more who's older than you who's been around these things longer and can yeah. kind of weigh in with some experience so you're not kind of going into things blind yeah. you know again we're all we're pro bible here <laughs> but pro bible yeah. verses but just yeah. saying you've done this well this verse says this is what I'm supposed to do with you right now it's like that you know there's a lot to be said of that but just wisdom and patience and talking through things as opposed to finding something out and trying to deal with it and trying to call them out and trying to fix it right then yeah. is always... Now, there are, there, there are things that need to be addressed right away, mm-hmm. but in terms of how you do it, um, this mindset, I have to fix it and I have to do all these things first as opposed to maybe taking a step back and thinking through, considering, hearing, understanding, allowing them to see why what they're doing is not the wisest thing mm-hmm. and the stuff like that. Yep. So, Number six, this one is... This happens a lot too. I guess this is why I've been called the money guy, which is just I'm not the money guy. I don't know. I, whatever. Yeah. Number six is clear and practical and or realistic a realistic launch plan, a clear launch plan, a practical launch plan, and a realistic launch plan. A lot of people are just like, well, I'm just going to gather people, and we're going to have this many people by then, and we're going to maybe do an event, and then we're going to launch in this date, and it's just very theoretical. Which to a degree, it has to be. It's, that's not a knock. But how are you actually going to, like, wh- how often are you going to meet? Where are you going to meet? How are you going to meet? How are you going to communicate money and expectations if people are joining your team? Like, how are you going to do this often isn't there. Now, this is why we created the Growing Your Launch Team course. That's right. Uh, this is not like a, this is a, this is a 100% shameless plug because we believe in it. Mm-hmm. If you're less than 12, if you're 12, 6 to 12 months, but even sooner, but that's like the ideal thing for the practicalplanting.com slash launch. Launch. We walk you through literally fundraising, how to plan events, how to plan a calendar. Mm-hmm. And also it has to be realistic. Like people are not going to come to stunt like three things a week yeah. leading up to it. Especially when it ha- your church hasn't launched yet because there's confusion about what that means. And mm-hmm. some people aren't going to show up at all. Or some people are, aren't, aren't going to join the launch team until you launch because pre-launch stuff, you were very unclear. But we have we have episodes, too, about how to grow a launch team and things to do. You just got to scroll scroll back down and, and find them. Yep. Um, some of our most downloaded episodes are those. But if you want it all in one place with more detail, it's practicalplanting.com slash launch is our Growing Your Launch Team course. But yeah, just like how are you going to, like if you're launching in six months or nine months, what is the calendar going to look like and how are you going to do it? Yes, things are going to change. You're going to tweak them as they go, but it can't just be, I think this is going to happen. Mm-hmm. Put on, it's like a budget. You put it on paper and you tweak it, but once you put it on paper, you have a plan that you can work through, and a lot of people don't have a real practical, workable plan. They just have ideas of what they think will hopefully happen. Yeah, I can speak to this from experience that it's extremely frustrating to be on a launch team that there's no mm. 
plan in mind. And I and I think it's easy to fall into this because it's easy to just kind of plan thing to thing. Like next week, whatever, we're doing a Bible study or event or whatever. And then once that's done, then it's, what should the next thing be? Yeah. And then what should the next thing be? And and just kind of time is just kind of crawling along, but there's no actually plan in place or not making any progress. And that can be extremely frustrating and difficult to people on your team because it seems, it seems like, and, and, probably truthfully that you don't have a plan yeah. and people want to people, people potentially want to be on your team and want to help do this thing but they need to know that there's a plan to actually make it happen yep. and if we're just kind of crawling along doing things as they come up or doing things here and there then it doesn't seem as if this there's a plan to actually make this happen it seems more as if we're just kind of hoping it materializes yeah. out of thin air we talk about this in our growing and launching course about like what sounds better if you're asking someone to join your team and they don't what if people don't know what they're committing to mm-hmm. They're going to be really hesitant to say yes. Yeah, for sure. And so if you're like, you know, we're hoping to gather enough people, we're hoping to launch in this place around this time, or here's the schedule, here's when we're launching, here's here's the plan, mm-hmm. people are much more apt to say yes to that and be okay with tweaks. Yep. Because you've like you they they know what they're committing to and they know what your expectations of them are and like that this is actually working towards somewhere. Mm-hmm. Now we're just going to keep doing this until something happens for us to be an official church. <laughs> yep. I would I would much rather be part of a launch team that has a clear plan. Uh, we're launching this, you know, month or day or whatever in this place. Ha- that we get there, that place falls through for, yep. for some unforeseen reason, and we have to make changes. I would much rather be a part of that than just kind of going along without a plan yep. because we're afraid that our plan will fail. Yep. It's okay if your plan fails. That will happen. But you need to actually have a plan in place for that plan to fail, <laughs> yeah. or else, or else, nothing's ever going to get done. People will much more likely say yes. Yeah. So we've got episodes on it again, our launch team course. But if if I if you're if you're in the pre-launch phase, or you're going to plant a church or whatever, and I were to meet with you and you were to ask me to join your launch team, you need to be able to tell me what I am committing to, hmm. not just hey, I'm going to be a part of this church one day, because yeah. it's really hard to say yes to something, especially if you don't know it's happening, you don't know if you can pull out of it? Like, what, what's going on there? So a very clear, very practical, and also a realistic launch plan calendar of what this is going to look like. We're, we're planting, even if you don't know the exact, like, place the church is going to meet, mm-hmm. like, a very vicinity, a general vicinity of, like, this part of the city yep. at this time. And people are much more likely to say yes, too, if it's clear and it's coming up. Having someone join your launch team 18, 18 months away is really hard. Having them join your launch team five months out is a lot easier, because they yeah. see a clear impact, a yeah. goal line, so... Clear, practical, and realistic launch plan. And then last but not least, just really think it's important to uh, emphasize local friendships. Now, if you're part of a network, this is, or a denomination, and you have other pastor friends and stuff like that, that's really helpful um, that, that you meet with somewhat regularly, I would say, not just like I know and I could call them if I want. Like there probably needs to be regular, whether it's like a monthly gathering or maybe you're in a cohort that meets a couple times a year or whatever that's like pre-scheduled so you know you're going to see them. Because mm-hmm. what I found is you might know people well, but unless you have... You already know you're, when you're going to see each other, and it's just left up to when we reach out, you, you eventually stop. Or you feel awkward because you haven't talked to them for a while. Yeah. Um, so that stuff is good, but I, I could not recommend enough local friendships. Um, Long-distance long, long distance stuff is fine, but you've got to have people that you can do life with. And I think both inside outside the church, we've talked about this in other episodes, about having you know friends with people in your church. Some people, that might be hard based on if you, maybe if you've been burnt by the church so that you might be like, well, I can't because I was, I opened up with this, uh, this church and I used it against me. And so that can be hard. Mm -hmm. But what I've seen a lot of is people going into ministry, assuming that they can't be friends with people in their church. And so they never even there. And so like, you know, one of the things you can do that, like if you lead a group being, being vulnerable, I mean, you can't say everything about the church or whatever, but like you can talk about how you're feeling and how things are going. And then, so having local friends in the church, and then I would even say someone outside the church that you can talk to, um, that regularly that you can share all your frustrations with, or not just frustrations, but like they don't know people at your church, so you can talk about stuff without breaking confidentiality or anything like that, yeah. because they would have no idea who you're talking about. Um, but you need to have local friends, not just people you've grown up with or people you've talked to, but I would recommend both inside and outside your church that you can, I mean, you're, you're doing life with. If you don't want ministry to be miserable, you need to have friends, and so making those friends is important. <laughs> and I think it's, uh, I think both, it, it, when you're talking about both inside, inside and outside the church, it helps to, if you get, fr- if you have friendships that get to the point of that every conversation isn't revolving around the church, yeah. um, which can be, which I, it happens in the beginning, especially people in the church. It's, it's, you're kind of common ground, so I, I get it. Yeah. But it's, I, I think it's really health, healthy to have friendships where you're talking about and spending time, not just 
small talk, but actually like spending time doing or talking about or whatever, things that are not just, here's what's going on in my church, what's going on in your church, bye. <laughs> you know, like, it's, it's I, I just think we're, we're people, and like, I think the church is super important, and obviously, I mean, I'm here, I don't, I don't, I don't want to d- diminish it in any, by any means, but I think we should have other interests and things that we enjoy and things that we can spend time with people doing. And if everything is just like, just talking about the church or just focus on the church 24 seven, then I think you're going to burn yourself out real quick. So having friendships that they can be part of the church, of course, obviously they can be outside, but that that's not just the sole focus of every time you get together. I think it's, is healthy. So if the church is your whole life, pick up a hobby and talk about that. That's right. <laughs> but Which, anyway, that, that's a, that's a good <laughs> extra tip actually is pick yeah, up a hobby. It's, yes. that, that's healthy. Um, yeah. So people in church and like for me, you know, I have a good friend who episode 169 fundraising 101, mm-hmm. one of our most downloaded episodes. You should listen to that. If you're trying to raise money, Jordan Pinley, he's a local pastor here. So we get up, we get together every other week. And so that's helpful to have someone outside the church too. That we can talk about stuff and be friends with, but mm-hmm. you need lo- all of this. Say you need local friends. If all of your best friends or closest friends do not live in your city, uh, you should still be. I'm not saying don't be friends with them, <laughs> but that that, yeah. that should like that should cause you pause to not have people close to you that you can speak into and enjoy life with. Yep. So, so those are seven of the biggest pieces of advice to church planters or and or people that are already planted. Mm-hmm. If you're, I, w- I would encourage you to think through those some of those things to help you be healthy for the long haul, because so often we, we are extremely short-sighted. We just think about the next six months, and then that becomes our normal life, and that's like all we do is we work too much. We have all these problems because we haven't been clear about what we want to expect. Yeah. So hopefully that was helpful. Again, some of the things we talked about, practicalplanting.com. There's a lot of free stuff there, but you can also get the launch team course. You can also get our newsletter, weekly newsletter there, the Facebook page, Practical Church Planting on Facebook. Yep. And then, of course, the churchcode.com slash practical. Put practical in the promo code, and you get 40% off. Or even if you just are on the church code and looking around, whenever you decide to join, they got great customer service. There's there's a promo code option at checkout. Put practical there, and you'll get 40% off. Two years, which is a lot. That's right. It's a big deal. Way less than $3,000. And (laughs) way better. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, And so, yeah, thanks for listening. We'll be with you next week on Practical Church Planting.